Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about is really some, share some of the work that we've been uh, attempting to do in community, bring communities together around improved outcomes for, for children. And I've said to a few people this week, in my next life I'm going to be a, a, a mouse researcher because you can um, order mice, I'm told, controlled for 20 variables and you do your experiment and if it fails you order another 20 with an extra variable thrown in. So this is very, very challenging work and uh, we don't have answers. Um, we've had experience that I want to share with you, but uh, I think this is the most challenging work in my career. Uh, and I've, like many of you people here, done um, uh, written grants and written papers, etc., etc. So what I'd like to do is just provide a context with you and uh, discuss uh, some of this. The increase in child abuse notifications, which is relevant for here, but also for every uh, high-income country in the world. Uh, we also have pressure on government budgets. We have a conservative government that's been elected who have fabricated a budget crisis, which is an excuse to impose their ideology on all of us uh, idealistic people. Well, that means services are reduced. There's concern about a weakening of the social uh, contract that has existed for a long, long time. Uh, we have a government with the, an ideology of small government, that is, uh, private services must be good, government services must be bad. Um, there's concern in a lot of the work we do that the government is seen as a sort of nanny state. Uh, lots of families don't like this notion of government interference in their affairs, and so there's pushback about that. And there's also a suspicion of science, as I know there is uh, to some extent here as well, a suspicion of scientists and a suspicion of science. So that's the context I think we both operate in, both countries. Here are some child prediction data in Australia. You can see there's been a steady increase. Uh, dropped off a little bit uh, in the most recent data collection, but uh, I don't think that's a trend. I think that was just probably an aberration for the one year, probably an aberration in reporting. Substantiations have remained much the same. They've sort of plateaued. And this uh, Cummins was a, a judge who led an inquiry that our state government um, just finished about six months ago. Um, and this is a sort of scary quote, if the rate of increase in notifications was to continue, one of four children born in 2011 will be the subject of a report by the time they're 18 years of age. So uh, just that statement alone suggests that we can't sustain the present way of trying to deal with these sorts of issues. Um, and some observations, it's in interesting we're getting a, a rapidly increasing rate of notification, but substantiations stay the same. Now, either that means that we don't have the resources to investigate all of the reports, or perhaps it's just a way of stressed families getting help, but in a fragmented service system where there aren't the resources to support all of the families, that's the way they get support. So, large increases also. Uh, in out-of-home care. This is now described as a crisis in Australia because we can't find enough placements or enough foster families. Um, we had a 45% increase uh, in out-of-home care. And what's really concerning, given the evidence about the importance of the early years, is the number of uh, different placements that many of these young children had. They go from one placement back to family, back to a different placement, etc., at a time when they really do need stability of relationships. So there's some evidence that the cure may actually be harming children. This is a study, one study of many, uh, talking about not just the placement instability, but the very strong association with persistent behaviour. And there's any number of studies now looking at the relationship between out-of-home care and unaddressed health, developmental and behavioural sorts of issues. So Dorothy Scott, who some of you may know, who is the doyen of child protection, both academics and practitioners, in 2006, um, eight years ago, wrote, most current child protection systems in Australia are unsustainable and potentially harmful. And then in an article a couple of years, uh, years later that she co-authored, the present child protection systems in Australia are costly and cannot be sustained in terms of workforce capacity. They're also not effective in terms of reducing family and community vulnerability to child abuse and neglect. Unless we put adequate resources into prevention, we'll have to spend increasing amounts of money on increasing numbers of notifications, etc., etc. So, a long time ago in Australia, and I dare say it's a similar situation here, there are calls that the present system cannot be sustained. 
we have to move towards a different way of doing things. So we do need to change. You know, uh, our society isn't static. There are changes in society that I'll talk about in just a moment. There are changes in families. Families now, at least in our country, I'm sure it's the same in England and the States, are very different than they were a couple of decades ago. There are service delivery difficulties. Many of our services have long waiting lists. There's burnout by staff. Uh, people can't cope with the demand. There's worsening developmental outcomes, despite that investment. Uh, we have striking new knowledge about child development that's emerged in the last couple of decades, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And new knowledge about intervention, an increasing uh, body of evidence that suggests that prevention and early intervention is not just feasible but effective. So there's a very rapid pace of change. Uh, this is just a, a, a number of points you'll be aware of. Uh, casual, the casualization of a workforce, the increase in disadvantaged populations, there are changes in family, and this has all been described by one of our colleagues in Australia as being a toxic environment for children. The environment in which young children are reared now is very different given all of those factors. And David Green, in a report he did for Very Street, which is one of our large NGOs, uh, this is a great quote. It's not as if we've lost the knowledge of what has constituted a good childhood, but it seems more difficult to realize it in the context of rapid change. And we have limited ways of protecting, <coughs> understanding, monitoring, and controlling the impact of progress on children. Shared cultural, political, and moral commitments to children are becoming confused, contested, and weakened in the face of unstoppable changes, disruptions, and uncertainty. Very nice encapsulation of what those of us concerned with children's health and development are struggling with. So we have service delivery difficulties in our country, and I'm sure you have them here, um, between universal, secondary, and tertiary services. Information flow goes only one way, and that's upwards. Universal asks, asks for support from secondary and from tertiary, and very little collaboration in, in real time between different levels. Um, referral arrangements, we have lots and lots of services that I'll show you in a moment, but often very narrow eligibility for requirements. So there are still wrong doors everywhere because people present, families present with multiple problems, but these are services that are being set up to address single issues and set up for good reason at the time. Long waiting lists, uh, kids fall between the cracks, um, and location difficulties. So specialist services are usually on the other side of town. Uh, um, a, a tram ride, a bus ride, a train ride away. Um, and um, we all, as you'll see in a moment, we sit in our offices waiting for people to come to us. And that constitutes very often a barrier for these families. So developmental outcomes are worse. It's been said this is the first generation of children that are less healthy than the previous generation in, in all of history. So we're seeing as pediatricians, I know several in the audience, and many, many other of you may be clinicians, we're seeing increasing rates of developmental, behavioral, and psychosocial problems. And a very clear relationship, which is growing larger, between social disadvantage and child outcomes. And the social gradient that is growing in our country, growing in your country, growing in most countries, is of increasing concern. So Green again says, despite Australia's left out of S there, economic wealth and prosperity advances in our professional knowledge, accessible services, the presentation of problems experienced by children continues to increase, and some are increasing very significantly. So in Australia, we see uh, a decade ago, using reliable questionnaire methodology, more than half a million children and young people with mental health problems. Last year, there were th over 350,000 child abuse notifications. Uh, 57,000 children started school, vulnerable in one or more areas of development, and this, the increases in these conditions that I mentioned before. So all of this suggests that uh, we can't continue in our present form. If we continue doing things the way we do, we'll continue to see the outcomes that we've always had. And then the Australian Early Developmental Index, which uh, many of you, some of you may know, this is a, an Australian adaptation of a Canadian instrument, about 104 items online covering five domains. Um, and this covers domains like health, um, literacy, communication skills, social skills, etc. And teachers complete this online for children in the first year of a child's formal schooling. 
We don't analyze the results of individual children. We aggregate the results and report back at a school, community, neighborhood, uh, regional level, etc., etc. And in, we've had two national rollouts now. So we have data now on 97% of all Australian five-year-olds mapped in terms of their health and well-being and vulnerability for every single community in Australia available in the public domain. So you know, it's a fabulous resource. And as I've said several times uh, since I've been in London, that's really started to change the whole social discourse uh, about children because it's an outcome of what happens in the years before the child starts school. It's also a baseline for what happens when the children uh, are at school. And you can see that one in four children, almost one in four children in Australia in 2012, arrives at school vulnerable in one or more areas and a significant um, state breakdown. We have startling new knowledge uh, in the last couple of decades about the importance of the early years. And uh, many of you are familiar with this. Um, the research is very clear now about what happens to a young child in his early years has lifelong consequences. So the brain ar architecture and skills are built in a very rigid bottom-up sequence. The foundations that are laid down in those early years are very important because it provides a base for all the subsequent um, competencies that a child develops. And skills beget skills. The development of higher order skills are at risk if the foundations laid down in those early years are inadequate. And what happens over time is the plasticity of the brain decreases. The developmental trajectories get more and more entrenched. The brain gets harder and harder to change. And any of you, any of you in the audience that have tried to pick up a skill as an adult, whether it's lots of smiles I can see coming back, whether it's a language, a musical instrument, a sport, of course you can do it because the brain is infinitely adaptable but it's so much harder to do it later in life. So, so the research is very clear, very clear, that biologically and economically it's far more efficient to get right the first time than to go back later on and try and fix things up. And what's really important is the quality of relationships, and this has particular relevance for child protection, but also has relevance for any of us that deal with young children that where relationship, relationships are good, where it's nurturing, it's warm, responsive, then the child usually turns out okay. When those relationships are dysfunctional, stress levels go up in that child's environment, high cortisol levels, stress levels go up in the child's brain, and persistently high levels of stress lead to persistently high levels of stress hormones, and that interferes significantly with the developing brain. So we now know that any sort of adversity that operates in that child's environment, whether it's severe disadvantage, whether it's family relationship problems, whether it's exposure to family violence, whether it's child abuse, whether it's parental mental health problems, has the effect then of putting at risk the relationship between parents and the child and therefore uh, interferes with brain development. Uh, and we, we can actually start to see changes in the genetic material and the late Clyde Hurston calls it the biological embedding of environmental events. Persistent stress, persistent high levels of, levels of stress hormones influence the various physiological systems and they get reset at a different level and then become more vulnerable to environmental events later on. Um, it's sort of hard to see this slide, but this, this is a New Zealand slide. You can see the sort of emblem of New Zealand in there. But you can see things unfold from an early age. A whole sequence of events and risk factors, starting from uh, antenatally, women who smoke or don't take care of themselves, uh, often a difficult delivery or a small for dates delivery because the mother smoked, um, no breastfeeding, uh, stressed early relationship, etc., etc. So by the time these get these kids get to school down here, um, there's been five years of difficulty in relationships and. and uh, risky events that have been happening. So stressed early environments lead to problems in children, the high rates of issues, of problems that I spoke about before. But there's now a, a robust body of evidence that's getting stronger by the month, suggesting that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, dysfunctional trajectories in those early years lead to lot, lifelong problems. So th these are some of the adult problems with roots in early childhood. And what's striking about, for me, about these is the wide range of problematic outcomes in adults that start early on. So it's not just mental health problems or family violence or poor literacy or unemployment. 
It's also crime and it's substance abuse and hard medical issues, medical problems like obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, etc. So there's increasingly robust evidence that if we want to get things right in adults, then we have to start in the early years. And that provides a wonderful opportunity for those of us interested in child health to advocate for increased resources in those, those early years. And the impact of social inequality is a concern in all first world countries and all <coughs> income countries. I mentioned before about the effect that chronic stress has. And these kids that have grown up in chronically disadvantaged environments are exposed to what we call double jeopardy. These are families that would benefit the most from the sort of support that we know exists, and yet they're the families that are least likely to get it. These are kids that would benefit the most from attending high quality preschools, often don't go. These are kids that really need to go to good schools with high quality teaching, but tend to live in neighborhoods where the schools aren't so good. So we start to see, at least in Australia, these social class differences uh, antenatally. So on the left hand side uh, is um, women who smoke during pregnancy. You can see low SES and high SES. And the top bar there is indigenous and non indigenous. We have a major, major health gap still between indigenous and non indigenous. On the right hand side of the graph, uh, women who's a uh, uh, low birth weight infant. You can see again a social gradient. So this starts even before children are born and then continues into preschool. This is a graph that most of us getting talks about early childhood used by Hart and Risley, a longitudinal study of children's language development. You can see by the age of three, well established different trajectories between children from different environments. But in Australia, we don't have to rely on American data anymore. We've got uh, our own data, which is even more disturbing. This is from a longitudinal study of Australian children, a representative sample of uh, Australian kids that we're following longitudinally. These are social and emotional difficulties. And you can see differences in um, uh, SCS start very early on. Same for communication, same for vocabulary, same for emergent literacy. And then at school entry using the ADI that I mentioned before, very, very clear differences between children who grow up in advantaged environments and those who grow up in disadvantaged environments. And this is uh, consistent right across all five domains. So Dorothy Scott again uh, talks about a public health approach to child prevention. She talks about the first wave uh, of child savers. Most of the children's hospitals around the world were built in this context. The kids were getting sick, usually children were poor, and we had to look after them. And this was a rescue movement for destitute children. The second wave is as we know it now. We're right in the middle of the second wave of child protection, battered babies, sexual abuse, etc. But she argues, and uh, given the data about the increasing, <coughs> pardon me, the increasing rates of, of reporting, etc., we really do need a very different approach to child protection. And she calls for a public health approach. And uh, 11 years ago in the UK, you called for that as well. Naomi's smiling again. Child protection cannot be separated from policies to improve children's needs as a whole. So I just need to say that ten years, a decade ago, the UK was held up as the example, the poster child of innovative, courageous public policy to do with children. Sure start, every child matters, and we're sort of reinventing the wheel again here. Even the Americans now, with respect, Matt and Eric and, and uh, Becca, even the Americans have now understood that we have to move in a different sort of a way. That was a cheap shot, Matt, wasn't it? This emphasis reflects the evolution of the field from prevention of maltreatment to promotion of family health. This calls for broad-based campaigns to reduce maltreatment because narrowly focused risk-based efforts may leave out many children and families. We can all relate to this, can we? So a public health approach to child protection means a focus on populations, not just on in individual children. An emphasis on health promotion and disease prevention. And it necessitates, and this will be at the basis for a lot of the rest of my talk, an understanding and development of health systems. And it should be even broader than health. We shouldn't be talking about community-based systems. And using the ecological model, an emphasis on the underlying social, economic, biological, environmental effects, etc. And of course, it should be evidence-based and family-centered. So 
traditionally, um, a lot of our effort has gone to this hard end, children in need of placement, children who, uh, when we investigate, the reports are substantiated. And then most NGOs dealing with child protection deal only with these two, the child protection intervention when they're reported. But we should be arguing for a broader approach again, targeting prevention and intervention for vulnerable families. And this uh, surely must be some of the rationale for the Blackpool Project uh, or some of the other five communities. Um, but we need to go even broader than that, universal protection for all children and families. Or another way to look at it is this pyramid of prevention and intervention. The bottom part is universal prevention for all children. Um, Michael Marmot, who is an Australian, calls this proportionate universalism, which is a terrible name. But what he means <coughs> is that all families, all families need a, a core number of services. And then you add on to those uh, services um, additional supports proportionate to the needs of each family targeted prevention, referral, etc., etc. And right now, we're really focusing most mainly on these two, and uh, a population health or a public health approach to protection suggests that we should give equal amount of effort and uh, time and energy to the bottom parts of that, of that pyramid. So again, every child matters. These quotes are uh, even more pertinent today, I think, than they were when they were first quoted here. Broadening universal child focus focused services so they are family centred, e.g. childcare, MCH, which is your health visitors. You can tell I've adapted this for an Australian context, preschools and schools. Broadening targeted adult focused services so they're family centred. In our country, there are a whole lot of services around uh, adults at risk and the kids are totally invisible, whether it's family violence, whether it's alcohol, <coughs> whether it's mental health problems. Um, whether or not they have children isn't even recorded many of these services, let alone um, services provided for them. Child protection cannot be separated from policies to improve children's health as a whole. No wrong door. It's a very, very sort of sexy concept, but it, as you'll see in a moment, very, very challenge, challenging to actually implement. Look at the whole family, build on a family's strengths, etc., etc. We have to stop this notion that child protection disadvantage, kids with problems are out there. Not my issue because I'm okay. And that's very, very challenging. So right now, our investments tend to be individualised and reactive. So I, as a paediatrician, many of you in the audience that are clinicians of one kind or another, sit and wait in our offices. Children come to us. We do the best we can, send them away. And that's fine, but given just the magnitude of the problem of how many of these kids are presenting now to services, there's no way we're going to change the world doing this. So we have to move towards a preventive population approach. We have to start looking at populations of children. In other words, instead of just devoting our effort to identifying and managing the group of children with problems, that hard end of the normal distribution curve, uh, ideally we should be focusing on the whole curve, on all children, and moving that curve to the left. And we sometimes call this uh, curve shifting strategies. Um, the idea is that if we take a universal approach, a proportionate universal approach, we'll reduce the risk to the whole population and then we'll actually reduce the number of children in that hard end. So getting back to this, uh, we do need to change, given uh, what I've just said. How do we change? Well, we need communities and services that are more inclusive, more supportive, and better integrated. So this conceptual model we've been working on for quite a while. We need more supportive communities, and I'll describe that. We need a more supportive service system, and importantly, we need an interface between the community and the service system. And what I'd like to do is spend the rest of my talk drilling down into these three components. Uh, and sharing some of the experience that uh, we've had in Australia in trying to do this. So we need to build a rich and supportive social environment for families with young children. Um, not many communities, few communities in our country we would consider as child and family friendly, where um, children and families are made to feel welcome. Uh, we need to develop ways in which the service system is able to respond promptly and effectively to emerging needs and risk factors not just to establish problems. And we need a well-coordinated and easily accessible system of services. And if we do that, then theoretically we'll get to good outcomes. But each of these components is pretty important. And that's why we're moving, um, and it, it sounds really negative and nihilistic, 
uh, to the conclusion that individual programs aren't going to work. The, the literature is full of very promising programs or ends of a hundred. <coughs> <Pardon me. coughs> with ends of a hundred that make a difference at a statistical level, but very few of those programs go to scale. Um, and the reality is that if you've got this particular issue, you've got half a dozen other issues as well. So it sounds nihilistic, but I think we have to move towards a much broader approach of building the capacity of families and communities. And that's much harder. Prevention enough is a hard sell, but try selling building capacity in communities to a politician or to a, a fundraiser. It's very challenging. But I really don't think that a new flash yellow one or a green one or a dark blue one is going to make a difference because of the difficulties and challenges in going to scale and maintaining program fidelity. So it's not as if we've got a, a greenfield site out there, but I know in your country as well as in our country, uh, there's lots of services out there, and I'll show you some, some mapping results in a few moments. But the services are fragmented, different colours, different shapes, different sizes, one service not talking to each other, not even knowing of each other's existence. And we know that there are barriers to using services. Just because the services are there does not mean that people use them, and indeed, the inverse care law would suggest that the very families that would benefit from those services are the least likely to use them. So there are structural barriers, there are family barriers, there are relationships or interpersonal barriers. So there are wrong doors everywhere. We have families and children falling between the cracks, even communities that have a full range of services. This is a, um, a mapping study we did for Dufton, which is a disadvantaged area. Uh, in Melbourne, we mapped all of the services uh, in that area, and this is a close-up, but look at the full range of services, and look how many, how few of those boxes are actually filled in. So most, most of these services didn't relate to other services. Um, this is a good example of lots and lots of services, but very poorly coordinated, let alone integrated. And this is a, um, a project we did in Melbourne South, which is a big growth area. Um, there's new families moving into there because houses have been built at the rate of a kindergarten every two weeks, you know, a school every two months. So huge, huge expansion. And this is a very complex looking slide because it's a child's journey around the service system um, between health and education and welfare. Um, wrong, wrong doors everywhere, barriers to getting services, referrals needed, transport issues, etc., etc. A very, very complex system. So at a minimum, when we work with communities, we should be trying to link up services in an informal way. And there's a whole methodology and training about how best to do that. But we should try and move beyond that, if we can, towards a sort of virtual one-stop shop. Um, we can't necessarily co-locate services, and co-location by itself doesn't always cut it. But everywhere that a child and family makes contact with the service system, that's the right door. I can't help you myself, but I can pass you on to somebody who can provide the services you need. So children don't fall between the cracks. Because it's not as if these most of these children and families are totally unknown. Somewhere along the line, they're making contact with the service system. So the way we do that, the way we start to build capacity, I think, is giving communities increased responsibility. Um, this is a great slide. Anybody who speaks Spanish in the audience? Matt, you speak Spanish? No. Vanessa Galliano, I, I, I get into trouble for saying this, is a Marxist Chilean radical philosopher who writes good books and writes poetry. The only thing you make from the top down is holes. Everything else has got to be bottom up. So Don Edgar writes recently, there's a, this is an Australian context, there's a vast complex of separate categorical quote services delivered top down to children and families rather than a coordinated attempt to resource families and communities so every child has access, etc. And that's what governments tend to do. That's what policymakers tend to do. They come up with the latest whiz-bang, whatever it is, and it's a top-down. Every community take it or leave it. Uh, and yet we know that every community is different in terms of its demographics, its service system, its aspirations, its risks, etc., etc. So we have to engage the community. As Michael said in his introduction, we can't just go into a community, oh great, you hear from government, you hear from Darlington, you hear from the Children's Hospital, we've been waiting for you, tell us what to do. We've got to engage the community in a sort of shared responsibility 
And that's pretty challenging. And this is where the ADI, or any source of data, has been so useful. Um, we provide maps. The, the data gets transferred using GIS, Geographic Information Systems, into these maps. So Maribyrnong is a disadvantaged community not far from the hospital where I live. Dark green is not good. Uh, light green is good. So even in a disadvantaged, disadvantaged community like Maribyrnong, you can see huge neighbourhood variability. So what is it about Braybrook and West Footscray and Maidstone where kids arrive at school much more likely to be vulnerable than Seddon and Yarraville? Now we can hypothesise what those are, services, access, uh, welfare dependency, libraries, parks, etc, etc. But the people in Maribyrnong are likely to know exactly what the issues are. So we feed these data back to communities very detailed quantitative data as well, so they can see in each of those domains, in each of these neighbourhoods, how their children are faring in comparison to state norms, the neighbouring uh, municipality, etc. And these, these are in the public domain, remember. So once we provide those data, communities come together um, and start to discuss, well, how come we're seeing these results? So it brings people to the table who normally would have real trouble getting there. And they start to ask themselves the questions, why are we seeing these differences between different neighbourhoods? And asking the questions starts to generate the answers. And we've seen uh, lots of anecdotal, um, uh, very innovative programs, lots of an anecdotes about communities that have come together without additional resources and done some very, very, uh, very interesting things to try and improve outcomes. So what happens is that ADI checklists get completed for all children in the community, they obtain a very comprehensive picture of how their community is doing in comparison with statewide averages. They plan actions to improve outcomes and then uh, they implement those strategies. And then three years later, we're just planning our third wave now of national ADI results. So our centre operates in these two areas. Um, we brought the ADI to Australia, so we've done that. But this is the area, I think, where the centre has a fair bit of expertise and lots of frustration in working with communities to try and develop these resources to help them interpret the data number one, but also to plan actions, implement and evaluate it. And what I'd like to do is spend the rest of my talk going through these in a fair bit of detail. Um, I'll rush through some of it because um, you know, if I go through every single point, we'll be here till 8 o'clock. And I'm happy to leave, leave the data um, with Michael and Kay. Um, and this slide is just to remind us that the earlier we begin, the lower the cost and the more likely it is that our intervention is going to be effective. And the longer we wait, the cost goes up and the effect effectiveness goes down. So the research is clear that biologically and economically, it's far better to get it right the first time than to go back and try and remediate later on. And most public policy is towards the right end of the spectrum. That governments in every jurisdiction where I've ever been wait until problems become so entrenched they can't ignore them anymore, then they throw money at it. So in our country, at least, when the media tackles a minister, what about this, what about that, the answer is always 100% in money terms. Well, we invested $50 million, of, and the implication is, well, OK then, and the media back off. But it's at a time when the cost is high and the effectiveness is low. And at a population level, to the best of my knowledge, the evidence that you can fix entrenched problems simply isn't there. So these are political solutions, they're not scientific solutions, because all the science is screaming out at us, we have to start much earlier in the child's trajectory. So how do we work with communities to implement change? Well, um, you've seen a version of this slide before, and what I want to do is to take you through these various strategies, etc. So first of all, we want to build a rich community platform where um, um, communities are child and family friendly. And this is, it's, I'll race through some of these, um, and you'll have to forgive me, but otherwise we won't have enough time for discussion. What we want to do is to build rich and supportive communities, and these are some of the strategies that we can't do, but we can just suggest these to communities. So we have no control over parks or transport or places where children and families can come together and meet. But we can be working with local government to suggest that these are very important components that they can be working on. And we can try and empower communities to advocate for these sorts of things. 
And these are pretty generic. These, and even though we've done this work in Australia, I think these are sort of generic strategies. If we, if we can develop a rich and supportive environment, we get a better informed and empowered community. Uh, we have stronger social support networks, fewer isolated and marginalised families. Because we know that social isolation is a major risk factor for poor child and family outcomes. We want to build a, a better service platform, and I've given you some examples of that before. Um, so we really want to move away from this slide with all its um, problems that I showed you before towards a much more integrated approach where there's, there's better overlap of these services, where secondary services spend some of their time with primary, uh, tertiary with, with uh, secondary, where there's a two-way flow of information and resources and strategies. Um, co-location really helps a lot. It really makes a big difference if a, a child and family that needs secondary or tertiary services don't need to go to the other side of town to get them. It's really helpful if they come back to the same place where they got the universal care and got it there. So we want to build a strong and universal service system backed by a well-integrated tiered system of secondary and tertiary services. And these are the strategies we use. So both horizontal and vertical integration. We want to do a sort of virtual one-stop shop. We also want a vertical integration where primary and secondary ter tertiary services work much more closely together. And if we do that, then we do result in improved coordination, improved capacity of services, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole idea then is to have easier access to specialist services and ultimately reduce their demand because the, the specialist services are sharing knowledge and information and building capacity in the secondary and the universal services. And so it goes on. So the way to cope with increased waiting lists is not necessarily to get more resources, because in times of uh, shrinking budgets, the, the chances of getting significant resources are pretty slim. The way to do that is to cut off the flow by um, increasing the capacity of secondary and primary services. We need to strengthen direct services, and that is high quality early childhood care options, blend early childhood and care, uh, provide high quality early education programs for three and four year olds, I know you've done that very well in the UK, uh, build strong links between early childhood services and schools. In our country there's different systems, or there have been different systems uh, in the first five years of life and then secondary, and then primary school. Um, now that's changed now because our Department of Education is called the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. But for services like kids with disability or kids with special needs, totally different funding mechanisms. So that parents and families have to start all over again with a very different system. So I want to whiz through these a little bit because I want to take you down to some of the other stuff. But you can see that you know, these aren't rocket science. You know, we've argued about these things for a long, long time to try and get them right, but um, I don't think any of these are contestable. These are sort of common sense things that we'd like to see in communities uh, if we're going to improve outcomes for children. Then we want to improve the interface between services and the community itself. And again, uh, there's a whole lot of strategies providing staff with training so they're skilled, um, you, ensuring that professionals use some form of early intervention system. Uh, we like the PEDS because it starts a structured conversation uh, with families around uh, children's health and development. So if we do those things, we get more effective communication between parents and professionals. We have a service system that much more closely matches the contemporary needs of children and families. Family, families make better use of the services. We're more likely to identify emerging problems at an early stage. Services respond promptly to them, etc., etc. So we've been working on platforms for the last 12 years now. We've had some um, very good arguments in our centre about that. And we call it platforms because it's not as if children suddenly emerge out of the woodwork with established problems that for almost all conditions that we're talking about, not the acute conditions of course, there are emerging clues from an early stage that things aren't, uh, aren't going on track. A child with 
persistent sleep problems or difficult with behavior or some language delay or parents that are doing it hard, etc., etc. If we, if we and, and children and families are making contact with the service system, even the hard to reach families make contact somewhere. They go to a GP for acute care or they go to see a maternal and child health nurse or they go to an immunization session. If we could reconceptualize some of those encounters into a platform where we're training professionals to systematically elicit any parent concerns, to identify any risk factors, then refer, then that's our best chance of a sustainable system that's owned by a community. So I just want to go through these four phases and look at the various components. So the first phase is raising awareness. And in our country, there's still, despite all our efforts over the last decade, there's still a variable understanding of the importance of the early years. And one of the early things we're trying to do systematically across the country is raise awareness. And there's a whole lot of strategies and resources, policy briefs, um, websites, etc. Um, these are examples of policy briefs that we have. Um, uh, about three, four times a year, it used to be six times a year, but then we lost funding for it. We take an issue in uh, child health and development or family issues and we do a quick scan of the literature. It's not a systematic review, but it's a pretty decent uh, review of the literature. And then we summarize that in 1,000 or 1,200 words in policy relevant implications. So we interpret all of the research data and all, all of these statements are referenced. And we make this available to policymakers increasingly internationally now. And this is not an advertisement, but if you go to our website, you can download the last 26 issues and you can sign up for future issues. Community Pediatric Review goes to every community nurse in the country um, four times a year, again evidence-based. Um, and there's a parent handout uh, that goes along with this. Grow and Thrive is a professional development uh, publication that covers the span three to eight years of age, so it covers that transition from uh, childcare into school. Uh, and then uh, we do various roundtables and invitation seminars and publish the proceedings. Um, Michael participated in the last one we did in Melbourne. And then we have a parenting website that um, has won quite a few international awards. Everything that, This is government funded. Everything that goes on here is peer reviewed um, and uh, it's very accessible. I was telling somebody at, at uh, some people at lunch that my favourite part of this is baby karaoke because years ago when we, when we asked parents what do they need in a website the re response from some of them was well we, we'd like to sing to our kids but we don't know the words or we don't know the tunes so there's a pull down menu here um, and a uh, choice of about 12 or 15 nursery rhymes with little stick figures and cartoon characters which is wonderful there's also an area called, a section called parenting in pictures which has uh, had a hugely increased demand in the last three or four years. And we interpret that as professionals downloading that, printing it out, and giving it to parents that have trouble with, with literacy or uh, with English language. So things like changing a nappy or breastfeeding, uh, etc., etc. So once we've raised awareness, we then uh, um, participate or help communities engage and plan. And there's a whole lot of objectives identifying stakeholders, reviewing local service frameworks, local resources, developing a profile of that particular community, helping them set priorities um, and establishing an ADI profile, and then a whole series of resources that we've developed as part of platforms over the last 12 years. Uh, and we run seminars, a lot of these um, resources are online, but we run fairly intensive seminars uh, for many of these areas. A guide to community engagement, a guide to planning, implementing and evaluating initiatives, and the ADI, of course. Phase three is implementing. Once communities know what they want to do, they then implement that. And again, we've got a series of uh, resources that we've developed and we're working with communities. And then monitoring and evaluation, and again, a series of various guides. So, um, and. The beauty of that for us is that communities can pick up anything. You know, idea, conceptually it's a sort of one-stop shop from raising awareness right through to evaluating, but communities are in such different stages in their understanding of where they're at, what they want to do, they can just pick any of these. That we have um, not formed a view that they need to start from A and then work their way through the alphabet. They can just pick any of these that they want to. 
And this, and this is never going to change, unfortunately, those of us that want some closure, because we're working with communities all of the time and we're getting feedback all of the time. So um, we're redesigning this. This is the latest incarnation of the roadmap and slightly different sort of conceptualiz conceptualization, but I quite like this. Start, build, learn, plan, implement, review. Isn't that cool? But the content is very similar to um, what I put up there before. And then finally, um, uh, the conceptual framework. We don't just work with local communities. We really try and develop this sort of work nationally. Um, to really try, as, as Becca said, similar to the Harvard Centre, we try and close the gap between what we know and what we do, or as Naomi yesterday quite rightly pointed out, to narrow the gap because research is evolving all of the time. And we've, got a, we've developed a conceptual model over the years. We've been at this for about 10 or 15 years now. We want policymakers to use the best evidence available um, to develop policy, uh, a whole lot of strategies from synth synthesizing the evidence, advocacy, engaging policy makers, etc., etc. Uh, a whole series of ways we do this. We want practitioners and service providers to use the evidence in delivering services. So again, we've got a number of strategies that are evolving and being added to all of the time. And then finally, we want families to use the evidence in their parenting. And we've got the website, um, we've got uh, the three uh, liter early literacy program, and increasingly we're developing a proactive media strategy, although we are hampered that we're part of larger institutions, which tend to be pretty risk averse. Here's just some examples. This is a, um, a, series, a whole set of posters, about 15 of them that have gone to childcare workers and preschools. This is my favourite, the world's greatest explorers and scientists, we're nappies. And this is linked to a two-page handout that early, early years professionals get. We don't know to what extent they take it up, but it, it's passive learning. But the idea is that the two pages are really about a child's innate curiosity and need for exploration. So when a parent goes up, oh, isn't that cute? Um, there's a, a teachable moment, there's a window of opportunity for the professional to say, oh yes, you know, that kids are really, it's really important to create environments where children can learn and indulge in their curiosity. Let's Read is a literacy program where we're training professionals to teach parents about the importance of, um, uh, of literacy. The, the, the research would suggest that the best way to change parent behaviour is where a trusted professional um, tells the parent continually to change that behaviour. So all of the brochures and pamphlets and things that governments like to produce, um, there's not much evidence they actually change behaviour, but um, if you go to a professional who tells you each time you see him or her, stop smoking or make sure that children, etc, etc. And if we've trained that professional to do that in an evidence-based way, that's the best chance of sustainable behaviour change. So Let's Read is an attempt to do that. All of our various publications that go to different professional groups have parent information leaflets uh, inserted. So if we do a lead article on obesity or on language development, there's a parent handout for that as well to encourage those professionals to engage uh, parents in discussions about those sort of issues. These are, just, these are all downloadable from the web. Um, tips, what babies like, book lists, etc., etc. So this is our opportunity, I think. But if we did nothing, most children, many children would fall away because of their biological and environmental risk. Ideally, we don't want that dotted line. We want this one. We want all children to fulfil their potential, to become uh, happy, well-adjusted citizens, paying taxes, uh, not in jail, etc., etc. We do do some good. Most first or every single high-income country and middle, many middle-income countries um, have a whole range of services and communities. You do, we do, etc. They do do some good, but we've got the knowledge base, at least in theory, to bring children from that red line to the green, green line. And that's the opportunity we have. That's why we're in this business, I guess. Um, to take this research, implement it in ways that make a difference. <coughs> And that's the opportunity we have as a society, as a country, uh, as a universal nation interested in the welfare of children. Thank you very much.